Start the recording. That's a good thing to do. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to people around the world. This is your host of the DB2 Night Show, Martin Hubel. And uh, we're up to show number 235 for DB2LUW. That's an impressive number. And once again, we have an extremely special guest with us today, uh, Pyotr Mirsajewski of the uh, uh, IBM Toronto Lab. He runs the whole show there. And uh, we're always excited to have the uh, view from the top, as it were. How are you doing today, Pyotr? I'm doing well, Martin. Thank you. It'll be exciting to be able to share some exciting news around the new DB2 space. It's a very dynamic. There's a ton, tons of changes that have materialized over the last six months or so with our latest release, November 2020 release 11.55. Uh, also, I would like to highlight our strategy pods. So looking forward to sharing this information. Fantastic. And we're looking forward to hearing it. So let's move. Let me get the housekeeping out of the way and we'll get underway here. Here's our, our social media page. Uh, main thing is to follow our Twitter hashtag to hear about upcoming shows on DB, uh, db Tonight. Our replays are now on YouTube, so you don't have to download anything if you choose not to. And our YouTube channel is getting more and more subscribers all the time, and that's great to see. Uh, this is our disclaimers and our uh, copyright notice. You are being recorded. We'll make things available as a, as replays, as we have always done. And we, we respect the uh, uh, trademarks and copyrights of our, our presenters. And there's our agenda, as always, and our upcoming shows. Our next show will be uh, Steen Rasmussen of Broadcom uh, speaking on uh, DB2's EOS on May the 21st. We're looking forward to having Steen back. He's a, a good presenter and an uh, important message from uh, one, of, one of the vendor partners of, with uh, DB2. And next month, we have uh, more information from IBM Product Management uh, using DB2 Graph and training and machine learning model on DB2 on cloud. And we've got uh, two presenters there. And to wind up our season uh, for this year is Tony Andrews of Themis talking about his famous uh, favorite uh, performance and optimization features on June the 18th. Also, keeping in mind that next month is iDug online as well. We're still in this online limbo that we've been in. One of the uh, Comedians I watch calls it a blank void as he sits in front of a, a blank screen. And it sometimes feels like that. And uh, once again, uh, our founding partner is DBI, and you can uh, watch their uh, demo if you haven't seen it by now. It's worth watching, and uh, those performance tools will make DB2LUW run faster. Our winner of last month is Karen Lachance of, uh, or Lachance of, of travelers, and uh, there's an Amazon gift certificate being sent your way. And uh, the sponsors, uh, once again, uh, DBI is our founding sponsor, and we're always grateful for their uh, help in putting the show on. And yours truly, Martin Hubel Consulting, here in beautiful, cloudy, cold uh, Toronto. With that in mind, I uh, thought of a cartoon. April was looking so promising in Toronto, and uh, and I uh, came up with this Canadian cartoon from the Ottawa, and uh, there are the people who said, well, I've had enough spring for one day, and so it looks like they're heading back in, and we feel like that. Last, last year, we had snow on May the 15th, a little dusting on my pool cover just as I was about to open it, and I said, maybe I'll wait a little few more days. And by the end of the month, uh, we were getting ready for our, our swimming season up here. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you know, if you don't like the weather in Toronto, just wait a day. It'll be, it'll change. It might not get better, but it'll change. So here's our um, polling questions. As always, uh, we have uh, first poll is um, just looking at uh, what versions of DB2 people are currently running. And uh, get people voting on that. Other. I also broke up the 11.5 11, uh, 11 stuff to uh, the mod levels to see whether we've got people on the uh, on the newer mod levels. Thank you. And uh, we'll see how people are doing there. Just getting a few people voting so far. Uh, 
See if we can get a couple more before we uh, close that off. But uh, yeah, people are a little slow. I feel like that today too. It just seems to. So we've got people on eleven one and people on uh, that are pretty new. That's good to see. We'll uh, hide that and move on and do the next one, which is uh, what other commercial DBMSs are you running? And I put a list there of. Uh, some of the uh, things that people run these days. That list has sure changed over the years. I guess the the winners are. Oh, we've got everybody. I got the entire collector series. It looks really colorful. Looking at my little window here. When I first got into DB2. The second job I had was working for the Ontario government, and we had the full collector series of DBMSs both on the mainframe and on open systems at the time. We'll share that. A coat of many colors there. Uh, everybody's kind of represented. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen many shops, enterprises, that actually have standardized on a single RDBMS. It seems yeah. that investments over the decades have them fluctuate depending on their workloads and stuff like this they were needed. So we see the heterogeneous landscape, yes. Yeah, and the other thing too is um, uh, you find uh, some, uh, in departmental databases, you'll find some departments that break ranks with the, the IT strategy. So you end up uh, inheriting a whole bunch of things into companies and, and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, just, uh, seeing where people are with uh, uh, containerization. That's, that's Thank you. And uh, we're not getting a lot of people voting just yet. I think people are just getting their coffee and getting settled. But uh, uh, containerize, containerizations for many people that work full time in IT. Um, okay. Some people have not embraced it. Some people are looking at it. And, uh, okay. That looks like what we have there. Uh, Sounds good. So it's a split. Mm -hmm. That also reflects what we see in the market. Yeah. And DB2 graph. Mm -hmm. Let's see what people are saying there. I don't think we've done a good job. And always, it's only been a tech preview since recently. Yes. Uh, so I, don't, I would not expect, but I would mm -hmm. be interested if there's an interest. Yes. And we're not seeing anyone. Uh, this stuff is still pretty new for folks. So I'm not sure we would see anybody saying, hey, I've embraced that unless they're, but. Uh, oh, I would say our tech preview was far from, was ready for embracement. Yeah. Well, we'll hear more about it next month when we have the product management folks Precisely. on. And there we, we see. So just one question, last question. I would like opportunity. Um, do the participants have an opportunity to ask you a live questions or do they have to put it in the chat? Uh, actually, where they have to put it is on our, our uh, final survey. We, we send out a survey to people. And we ask them, uh, if you have questions you'd like to have them uh, put on there or, or specific things you'd like to have people put, we can, you can state that now and people can, uh, and okay. we can see if they, uh, if there's something of interest that comes out of that. And uh, this is, um, an interesting thing on the pacemaker for the uh, DB2HADR. You know, I went back through my notes or uh, looking back through over my customer list, and the first time I did an HADR implementation for a customer, mm -hmm. we spent four days doing it because we wanted to test everything, and that was in 2004. And these wow. days, these days, we uh, uh, if we have to put HADR in, for, HADR in for a customer, it takes under a half an hour. Excellent. <laughs> but at the time, you know, they, oh, let's see, let's turn off the server and see what happens. You know, and this, all the all the stuff, the dynamic client reconnect. They wanted to see everything work. So we we learned a lot. All right, we'll close this off. And uh, I would have given this a high priority myself, but but there again, I don't get a vote. So we'll <laughs> we'll we'll share we'll share. Okay. It. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, there's people doing things already, so it's it's one of those things, you know. So, uh, all right. So, 
that's the end of our polls for now. I think that's the last one I had, yes. And uh, we'll move on and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. The presenter. I will stay online and uh, I will monitor the chat for you and uh, let you Wonderful. know. Wonderful, I appreciate that. Questions. Okay, I can see actually the presentation is projecting. So thank you everybody for taking time to actually join the session. Um, so today we're gonna do essentially overview of the pillars of DBT strategy. How, where we've progressed, where we've invested over the last year and a half, two years, what from initiatives is already available, which of those initiatives that are perhaps not fully GA, they were in tech preview or so on and so forth, would be available with our new release, which is coming out in June. Yes, June 23rd, I believe, is the release of 11.56. Now, if you look holistically, the enterprise have been changing. Uh, the investment areas have evolved. Hybrid cloud, AI, machine learning, data science, new development ecosystems, modernization via containers, embracement of hybrid clouds has left the CIOs with tough decisions. Obviously with environment surroundings of uh, relational databases changing, the ecosystem changing, the database had to evolve. And the three pillars that we've been focusing on is building DB2 to be basically ready and powered by AI and ML. So leveraging, creating ecosystems for data scientists, creating ecosystems for developers, as well as being making DB2 ready for hybrid clouds. So moving away, moving away of obviously still investing in on-prem deployments, still investing in our appliance business, but now enabling customers to actually deploy DB2 in a number of factors on all cloud providers. No longer only on the soft layer, IBM cloud, not only perhaps as a service on AWS, but also providing means of actually deploying on Google Cloud, soft, uh, sorry, Google Azure, or even Alibaba. Last but not least, uh, enterprise grace and resiliency. Now, while I only have four, as you can see, four or so categories in each of those items in each of those, by no means this means this is a comprehensive list of the features we have delivered. However, those we believe are actually have providing great value for our customers, hence would like to focus on those. Without further ado, so with, um, with embracing the machine learning and making the DB2 the best database for data scientists, we provide a set of various capabilities. One of them that I would like to talk about is the Python UDF. Python UDF is intended for scoring of Python models by internal uh, user-defined functions inside DB2. Now, this allows actually the intent of it is to have data scientists work in the Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Labs. They work with Scikit-Learn, Keras, TensorFlow, XGBoost. There's a number wealth of machine learning frameworks. Now, when this model pipeline itself is actually saved and completed, we now provide a means of actually deploying an Angel DB2 engine for the batch scoring. Now, this not only provides you improvements in the speed of actually inferencing, which is the scoring due to the fact that we do not have to ship the data to the model hosted some externally, but also provides you with additional security, security improvements in a sense and audit capabilities since the data never leaves the DB2 and the only data that is being returned to the application is actual scores of that machine learning model. Another use case that we've added into DB2 from a perspective from machine learning adoption is actually ability to actually go through the life cycle of model development, training, and data pre-processing inside a DB2 engine via external uh, ex internal stored procedures. This was intended for situations where security and some governance capabilities will not allow the data inside the DB2 to be moved out for the purpose of training or scoring machine learning models. As such, a data scientist have, can use tools, anything from data exploration, uh, data processing, model training, with traditional algorithms they're used to, like k-means clustering or linear regression, decision trees, and finally the model evaluations, all within DB2 engine. Now, one can ask if those are those procedures as performant as cycle and framework outside of the database engine, and I will admit they're not. However, this is for some specific situations where security constraints will not allow the database administrator to release this data to be actually taken out of DB2 engine and you know, basically transferred somewhere to different work devices where the data scientists work on them. 
Another aspect I would want to highlight about, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, is DB2 graph. Another enhancement that we've added in the, I believe it was 11.55, our November release, we have actually released a tech preview of DB2 graph technology. What is very unique graph has been actually right now getting quite a lot of tractions, and we see uh, enterprise grade or paid offerings like Neo4j growing very strongly in the market. We see Jonas graph, which is open source, open source uh, graph database technology having huge adoption. Now, DB2 works also just like Jonas graph and Neo4j with a gremlin query language. It is also working with property, property graphs. However, the huge differentiation is, is that the data that is actually represented as a graph and presented for graph queries does not have to leave the DB2, meaning the data changes are automatically available to the graph queries, and also there is no need for data, data replication. So both Neo4j and Jonas graph, or even Oracle's implementation of graph, require for the data to have to be, that to be done for the graph analysis to be actually loaded into separate graph database. So within DB2, the data persists inside the database. We have created the overlay from a Gremlin graph language query language into the SQL. So we've created those translators and we have created the overlay that creates the mappings between the intended nodes and vertices of the graph into DB2 tables and then DB2, uh, DB2 columns. We have added tons of, uh, I'm, I'm truly proud what the team has done. And considering we have a dedicated session to the graph, I don't want to steal the thunder. But we have added things like discover, uh, relationship discovery. And the graph queries work great, for example, for business analysts, for example, when they actually do any kind of um, uh, financial crimes insights, any kind of uh, uh, dispersed relationships where they're not obvious and have to look through the much more depth, more depth layers of the data itself. So in June, release of the 11.56, the graph will GA. It does come with the full UI interface and it's part of the DB2 package. Um, last but not least from uh, ML space, we've been talking about this prior, prior, but we will have another tech preview in ML6 with our intent to finally have a beta or perhaps even GA of ML-based ML query optimization in a V12 of DB2 that's gonna be June 2022. Now this replaces or arguments initially our cost-based optimizer with a machine learning neural network model that is trained based on the statistical data from base table statistics, column group statistics, so on and so forth. And that model in turn is providing cardinality estimation when the queries are running, predicate filtering factors, so on and so forth. Uh, we are actually very excited about the, uh, by the results we are seeing as the deviation of the errors that we see in our MMS optimizer is factors smaller than what we see in our cost-based optimization. And as to everybody on this call understands that if we make a mistake in the table base table cardinality estimation, we can be factors off when we actually try to calculate the cost of a specific query and choose the best optimal query access plan solution. So this kind of wraps, this kind of wraps our ML AI story. And we are expanding this story. Just to add, for example, in ML6, I have not mentioned it here, but just like with the Python UDFs for all the Python machine learning models, we are adding R UDF support, meaning that for statisticians using R language inside the R Studio, we're not providing the same means of deploying those R models and training them and I mean, scoring them on the side of the DB2 engine via R UDFs. So we're gonna continue this. We're working with the farther, farther enhancements, uh, integrating DB2 well with the Jupyter notebooks, allowing or pushing, automating those pipelines and so on and so forth, thus creating DB2 ecosystem for data scientists and machine learning developers that would allow them to work with the tools, IDEs, and the frameworks and libraries of the choice and effectively use them with the DB2 itself. Now, another big topic that has been vibrant in our industry is this all around hybrid cloud and developer inclusivity. Long are the gone are the days where you know Java and C were the developer languages, longer the days. Uh, long gone are the days where CLI or JDBC or DBC were the only uh, ways of interacting with DB2. We have seen explosion of various languages like importance of Python, Ruby, Node.js, and the frameworks like the Django, Rails, or .NET. With that in mind, 
we have been seriously investing in creating the best experience for the developers that want to work with the native language of the choice and work with DB2. I'm happy to announce in the November release of 11.5.5, we have also released DB2 Connect extension for Visual Code Studio Code. Now, upon analysis, we realized that Visual Studio Code has become the favorite IDE for over 50% of the developers in the market. That has drastically switched from the times where Eclipse was leading the market, right? So with that in mind, we've started investing in those frameworks. And currently, the V2, this is the V2 of our VS Code extension, does provide all the means for the developers to create open, like write SQL scripts, uh, work with stored procedures, debug UDFs, triggers, aliases. So now it's a rich ecosystem that allows us to work developers to actually work with DB2 and develop effective applications and the tools with the languages of the choice. Additionally, what we've realized is that the developers themselves changed how they want to work with actual applications and the databases, right? Uh, I mentioned CLI, JDBC, or DBC. Obviously, all this is still supported, but with the explosion of new UI development frameworks, like, like for example, React.js or AngularJS or the Node.js themselves, those applications are actually created, and those frameworks expect the applications to communicate via REST APIs. And this is what the developers understand. So happy to announce that we do have a G8 version of DB2 REST API service that allows developers to submit any static or dynamic SQL as a, REST, as a REST API post request that in turn creates a DB2 service, REST based service with obviously all the REST methods of get, push, post, put, post, delete uh, to allow to execute this kind of SQL statements via REST calls. Additionally, additionally, those REST calls, first of all, are synchronous. Second of all, they communicate with JSON itself. So now developers don't have to worry about the data format. They can work with REST APIs the way they're used to with any other applications, and they can work like this with DB2 service. Now, when we talk about modern application development, modernizations of applications, a containers by far have become de facto um, equivalents of modernization. Now, DB2's journey with containers have begun four to five years ago. And we've been, excuse me, running DB2 the first, in the first generation containers, Docker-based generation containers, in our clouds and our appliances for a number of years. However, what industry has realized, and we, our understanding followed, is that containers are fine. Now, you can have a one instance DB2 running, but what becomes actually even more beneficial if you can standardize on operations of your services and your applications in a containerized fashion and using container orchestration technologies like Kubernetes or Red Hat OpenShift. Now, industry by far has ad adopted Kubernetes like de facto leader in a container orchestration, and Red Hat OpenShift is de facto leader when it comes to enterprise grade secured container orchestration deployment platform. I am happy to announce and say that as of December, I believe it was mid-December 2020, DB2 has become the first enterprise grade RDBMS to be certified on top of Red Hat OpenShift and available as the operator on Red Hat Marketplace. And let me explain, let me talk a little bit about operators and why this is so important. Now, if you were to go to Red Hat Marketplace, Okay, and you will go to the databases, uh, the databases section. You will find that there's about 16 or 17 databases in there. You will find Mongo, you will find Cockroach. First of all, Mongo is not the RDBMS, it's a document store. Cockroach is nowhere nearly capable with full of features and able to run enterprise level workloads like DB2 is. Uh, you will find certain databases you probably never heard about. Those are those open source things that I just, or startups that are kind of popping up, but you will not find their Oracle you will not find their SQL Server for Microsoft. You will not even find the certified operators for enterprise Postgres. DB2 has become de facto the first one to lead in this way in a container wars. And I'm gonna call them as container wars because the enterprises want to lower the cost of ownership. The ROIs, they have to be lowered, right? And how are we gonna achieve that when it comes to managing applications and managing the databases? 
And this is the value that containerization and container orchestrations, as well as the operators, bring into the space. And it all comes from SRE, DevOps kind of perspective. Operator itself, it's essentially, you can think of, they can be written, by the way, in Golang or Ansible, and it's your automation. This is your SRE engineer that abstracts everything that relates into specific lifecycle application management. And operators come in five levels. DB2 at this point, as described on this picture, has operator level one, which is installation, meaning with a click of a button, you can actually deploy the DB2 instance, okay? And we support OLTP deployment, warehouse deployment, as well as even HADR deployments out of the box, meaning that your primary and the standby will be deployed using this operator and all the configurations between them will be set up automatically for yourself. The second level of operator are seamless upgrades. And here again, DB2 has already have that supported, meaning that whenever DBA is ready to upgrade DB2 instance, the operator itself will handle all of it, meaning pulling in the latest image of DB2, the one is to be upgraded to meaning sh shutting down, basically deactivating database, replacing the container itself, upgrading it all in automated fashion. And we consistently see a 20 minute performance, 20 minute duration, we can get the upgrades done. In cases, if it is actually HADR deployment, the operators allow you to actually have a green upgrades, online upgrades, meaning the operator will decommission, upgrade the standby, then it will actually transfer the traffic to the standby, will upgrade the primary, and then get the traffic back sent to the primary while letting applications continuously interact with DB2. Now, the le third level of operator, as you can see here, we don't have it fully yet in DB2 certified because this talks about a full application lifecycle management, meaning your backup and restore, your scalability, your scaling, all those kind of recovery scenarios all have to be covered. And in that sense, I'm happy to say we're halfway there. So what would be the value what would be the value of going running with DB2 containers? Well, you can lower your cost of administration of DB2 instances. Anything from a new installations, upgrades, recovery scenarios. In case if DB2, when running, for example, DB2 OLTP in containers, we are consistently see that even in an advance, even in an advance of shutting down a full VM onto which DB2 is running, the automation, the HADR, HADR automation in the containers is able to gracefully, gracefully switch to the standby, reroute all the applications, okay? And do this between two to four minutes with the maximum, maximum disruption to application in a two to four minutes range. Two to four minutes is pretty much the time where the DBA could be paged out to take a look what is happening with my system. And by the time they actually get to the terminal to take a look, the whole situation will be resolved itself. And now we go to the point, okay, RCA, how do I bring my primary back? So I'm back to the HDR configuration. Additionally, from a container perspective, all the premise of the containers that basically we have a repeatability, meaning I can spin up multiple instances. I can start looking at look, look, using cloud native storage providers like OpenShift Corsair Storage or Portworks for our warehousing and resiliency. We're using, we're using uh, container restarts to improve resiliency of DB2 in case of any internal process. And all this is happening automatically. If I was to look at this from a perspective of what kind of uh, timelines, what kind of times I can do and what, can, what is already handled automatically, as I was mentioning, and please pay attention to this automated and the times that are actually we see in our internal testing. So as you can see, install two to four minutes, upgrade 20 minutes, HADR takeover, and it went from two to four minutes. Recover from internal DB2 failures in the warehouse, it's about three minutes plus partial recovery time. And all of this is fully automated. Now that, if I was personally a DBA, that would be of interest to myself. Now, I often get, when I talk about this in this, in this section, is I often get, okay, can I get, can I get the same performance? I got tough SLAs. Okay, you're looking at all TP applications that are supposed to execute tens, like thousands of the thousands of transactions per second, or I have a you know ETR workloads on the warehouse and I'm you know, I'm moving a terabyte of data per day. Can DB2 in containers handle that? Well, I'm happy to say that in the slide over here you see the reference architecture 
uh, from on the Red Hat itself. And we've been working on the white papers and reference architecture papers regarding what are the optimal configurations that will give you the performance that you expect from DB2 running on-prem to DB2 running in containers. For example, the white paper that you'll see over there, it's running DB2 MPP warehouse on OpenShift, OpenShift container storage on AWS. We're in process of writing more papers about resiliency and the performance characteristics, but in our experimentations, we are confident that you can achieve the same level of performance you expect on-prem with all the promise of additional enhancement from resiliency administration perspective, SRE type of activities that containers allow us to automate. Okay, now, Another aspect that comes to this topic, and I was I was seeing basically by the responses uh, in a service is often people say, oh, well, I'm considering containers, perhaps I don't have skills, this looks all interesting, but you know what, I have a 11.1 or 10.5 even DB2 databases on-prem, how can I get them in there as my team doesn't have expertise? With that in mind, we have developed something we call DB2 click to containerize. And DB2 click to containerize is a tool that takes your on-prem DB2 version 10.5 of 11.1 databases or 11.5 as a source. It analyzes all its parameters. It points at the shell of the database, the, the DB2 in a container running on OpenShift or Clapac for data, and does the whole con up upgrade and containerization on the fly. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for the effect. Essentially, your team does not need to have very strong skills in containerization because this tool will actually analyze the on-prem database. It will analyze the shell of the container that you would like to move your database to. It will give you an IO as a DBA and options to confirm which configurations, if there are differences, would you like to persist? Okay, and then with one click, it will essentially shift the whole database, including the logs, the mirror logs, storage paths, external UDFs, DB config files, even key store security data, and it will shift it and actually deploy it into container, and you will have exactly the same database running in a containerized fashion in deep, on OpenShift or Cloudpack for Data. Now, we have tested this over 15,000 kilometers internet connection going from AWS, I'm sorry, Azure in Australia to AWS in US, 15,000 kilometers. And we were able to move 1.2 terabyte database, we were using good network, in about one hour. So we look at this as the first one for the DB2 OLTP use cases. We're working on further parallelism of this approach uh, to allow for moving actually larger warehouses. So we would definitely at this point where we can recommend this tool for anything after five, under five terabytes to our actually, it's a great, great solution to actually try it out and see the experience and the advantages that running DB2 on OpenShift containers will provide to your organization. Um, this tool is already available as beta for download. Uh, it will be GA with our June release of 11.5.6, DB2 11.5.6. Uh, things, few things to mention over here. This tool is right now supported only for uh, Linux, AIS, Linux, x86 Power, and Z-Linux. Well, AIX, due to NDNS, it's more complex. We're working out the quirks around that. So this will come in a subsequent releases. Uh, the last question I get on this, it's uh, what does this cost? Well, it's free. We want to help our customers modernize their workload. We want to show them the path, the easy path to go into DB2 containers. As such, the tool now comes free as a package. If customers purchase DB2 cartridge, which comes with the dual entitlements for DB2 on-prem, DB2 in containers, the, even the OpenShift itself, this tool comes as part of this entitlement. Excellent. Now, so we've talked about machine learning and AI. We've talked about how DB2 is creating ecosystem for data scientists. Uh, we've talked about how DB2 is becoming a leader in the containerization, modernization, and provides the ecosystem, uh, not only to containerize operators and all the stuff, but also means the tools like click container, containerize uh, for, to, for enterprises to actually help them in this journey. But let's not forget that all these ecosystems for developers and data scientists are still based, the core of the DB2 heart is enterprise grace resiliency that comes from our engine. So from that perspective, I would like to talk about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, in the, with this whole mission to move into hybrid cloud, we recognize that TSA, 
our two volume storage manager, the clustering manager solution that we use for HADR and pure scale, has had a hard time catching up with the demands of the market. As such, we, we began our journey of looking at alternative solutions. And in 11.54, June 2020, we have released tech preview of a pacemaker, integrated pacemaker and chorusing solution as a replacement of a TSA. Uh, I'm happy to say with our November, 8 of November 2020 release, we have GA this capability with multiple standbys. So now the TSA and pace, sorry, pacemaker and chorusing supports OLTP with three standbys, the same as TSA. It allows for the two node fencing support with AWS and it's a fully supported by DB2 GA solution. This solution was certified by SAP in three weeks post this availability. So we see tremendous, tremendous, tremendous interest. Now, how does it compare to TSA? Well, in all our testing, we find that Pacemaker to be 30 to 40% faster in all recovery scenarios than TSA. We found that the resource model is so much simpler than the resource model defined by TSA. Even from a debugging perspective, TSA generates over 100 different files that have to be analyzed to analyze the problem. With Pacemaker and Chorusing, we have about 16. With the Mod 6 GA, this solution would become bundled itself. At this point, in 11.55, it requires separate download. For 11.56 GA, which is in June, so essentially next month, this will become pre-bundled in DB2 installer. With a further enhancement coming for the support for DPF, HA, as well as eventually for pure scale. Martin, I just, I am so sorry, I have to have a body break. Uh, can you just take for a couple of minutes here and maybe check if there's any questions and I'll be back in 60 seconds. Sure, I, actually this is probably a good time for me to run the little commercial we normally put in for DBI. So let me just take control back and I'll do that. Uh, uh, whoops, I just gotta get the right guy here, sorry. I'll just take back control for just a minute here. And uh, what I'll do is show this video.
that sure was a cool demo. Martin, should I take it back control or? I'm going to get, I, I will give you back control. I think I have to give it to you. So let me do that just Fair enough. Perfect. And I see. Okay. Yep. Uh, let me share my screen and continue conversation. I'm sorry, Thank everybody, you. for the disruption. But again, this will this looked like an exciting demo and quite a nice feature to be able to leverage. Yes. All right. Thank you. So now to close the topic. To close the topic on the on the pacemaker. Uh, questions that I often hear. Um, what other value does it have? Now, it will the pacemaker be supported? Do I have to open some other tickets or pursue pacemaker support? For example, Red Hat itself offers pacemaker support, and I'm aware of other other uh, organizations, other companies offering pacemaker support. First of all, pacemaker has been an industry for over 16 years. It is widely adopted, available on all the clouds, and used by hundreds, thousands of enterprises. Now, in DB2 organization, we have been developing a pacemaker expertise to be able to support DB2 customers fully. And this is our statement and another value proposition. We will fully support any pacemaker issues that are discovered with db2 with pacemaker that's bundled in db2 i just want to make it clear so if the customers install db2 bundled pacemaker version db2 team will support it now the question after comes guys can you do you have experience in pacemaker i am happy to say as of a month ago db2 for the first time in history over 30 years has actually contributed to the open source project and it is was extension to the pacemaker resource model as we work with Pacemaker, we're finding that DB2 clustering solutions have more requirements that the Pacemaker had. So we've actually asked, we actually pushed changes to the upstream project that were accepted, and we're working on getting a committer status. This is to give our customers confidence that, yes, we are not only providing as a bundled solution, integrated solution, but we have skills enough to support customer production systems. Thank you. So this will be a Pacemaker in our HADR story. Another thing we're very we're, uh, we started looking how what are the I, I call them low low cost but high impact items that we can actually introduce in DB2 to help overall experience. And one of those examples I'm super proud of is us reworking how we work with memory allocation during database activation time. And activation time is important as it is part of, for example, any upgrade scenario or any crash recovery type of scenarios, planned or unplanned outages, so on and so forth, right? Historically in DB2, and this is actually essentially mostly, I would say, applicable to warehousing type of applications. And what we've observed is that when we allocate memory to buffer pools, so let's say, as you can see by the graph over here, we go from anywhere from 128 to 500 GB, it would take all the way up to six, seven minutes for us to activate database as we waited for the full memory to be allocated. Instead, we moved to lazy allocation model where we allocate the first chunk of memory and it could be, let's say, 24 GB. Okay, then we'll all end. We activate the, uh, activate the database and we allow the application to start connecting. It is our expertise that, and that, by the way, consistent experience around 10, 6 to 10, 12 seconds. So, this is how drastically we are able to shrink this activation time. And as we all understand, and, uh, would it be upgrade, would it be crash recovery scenarios? Every minute counts. By the way, that feature is enabled by default. So all customers that will uh, go on the 11.5.4, I believe, and higher, will get this feature out of the box. Nothing to be done by yourself. Another aspect comes with modernization of applications and changes in the hybrid cloud. So single sign-on, obviously, it's becoming expectation from number of applications and modern, modern applications. With that, in 11.5.4 and subsequently 11.5.5, we added further improvements. We've added a JSON Web Token, JWT, support as authentication mechanisms for DB2. I see we're running out of time, and I still have a couple slides, so I'm not going to stick on it. I'm sure, Martin, I'm not sure if we are, we've had security-driven sessions for DB2, but perhaps there has been quite a lot of enhancements happening in DB2 security. JWT Token is only one of them. Additional aspect enhancements to audit. Uh, for example, LDAP caching for OLTP applications. So I would suggest perhaps that we could have a security-centric session on any future DB2 shops. Another aspect I want to talk about is um, adaptive product management. 
So workload management, it's something that is critical, especially in a warehousing space, as it allows us to kind of um, create classes, a specific, I would call them swim lanes for our applications. Now, on-prem, for the on-prem customers, all the way up to the current version, the only thing that is available is our traditional workload manager, our first generation one. And that workload manager would actually classify user requests in those classes or swim lanes, but the inefficiency of it, it would only take the optimizer time run estimate to actually decide which cost of the query would be high and which cost of the query would be low. As you can imagine, this is a very limited picture. And often while the workload manager is helping in many use cases, those estimates would be fairly inaccurate, causing you know, us sending queries to the wrong class. So we have come up with adaptive workload manager, where we infused a machine learning paradigm of actually a feedback loop. Furthermore, not only no longer we only look at the time run estimates, we actually look at time estimates, memory, actual time history, memory actuals. So as you can see, now we have a full body of CPU time controls uh, that we take into account, into account when actually calculate the cost of the query. Additionally, we simplify these classes and the swim lanes. The administration of those have been drastically, drastically simplified. We've added concepts like session priority. We've got a concept like CPU controls. You can set up the hard CPU shares, or you can even set up with the mod six, which is gonna GA in June, you will have the ability to set up the soft CPU shares between the classes. And just to slow down on the soft CPU shares, it means is that when I have a, let's say for simplicity's sake, we have two classes. Okay, one is going to be my fast queries, one is going to be my longer queries, and I'm going to have 50% of CPU for the short, 50% CPU for the, uh, for, uh, excuse me, for the long running queries. While on surface this might work, but during the operations, we often find that while the generic 50% works for 80% of the cases, there are peak times when one class is underutilized, while the other is actually could use more resources. And that's where the soft CPU shares come into play. With that capability, you'll be able to refine 50-50 as a soft shares. However, if one class is underutilizing its share and the other class needs more resources, those resources will be temporarily transferred to the class that needs more and, and released when the previous class will start seeing the larger workload. So all in all, this solution will be available for 11.5.6. Obviously it's available on our clouds, it is available on our appliances, and it will be available for our customers on-prem, both from column and the row warehouses. And that's coming this June. Now, over the last year or so, we have done tremendous amount of improvements from perspective of uh, runtime, compression, and I could spend quite a lot of time and list about 30, 40 features that went in to improve our especially blue engine. We're talking about our columnar warehouse engine, okay? However, instead, I'm just gonna say that we have reworked how memory in blue is being run in the runtime in the engine itself. Uh, we have went from a static memory allocations for the full length of, let's say, Varsha columns to dynamic memory allocations, uh, basically based on the data that's inside that specific row in that column. We have improved, we have added another layer our compression. We've added ability to recreate compression dictionaries to leverage both Hachman compression, LZ4 compression. And we work all the way to the Nimbit. Now, now what does this all mean? The reason I just left it kept it on a high level because our internal feature names might not mean much. However, from all this, here are the results. What you're looking at right now is our comparison, this is our 11.5.4, what the gray line is our 11.5.4, that's June 2020 release on a row store. This is warehouse row. The light blue line, it's our 11.5 blue GA from June 2019, so a year earlier. And the dark blue line is our June 2020 release. Now, the data that's presented, it's part of our SAP certification. I'm not sure if everybody is here aware, so I'm just going to state it. Um, DB2 and SAP, we currently have close to 5,300 customers, SAP customers running DB2. As such, every release of DB2 has to be certified by SAP. As part of that certification, we run the full suite of all DB, oh, sorry, 
SAP BW workloads, and here are the results. In essence, within the one year, the Blue Engine was as improved 60 to 80 percent from 11.5 GA in June 2019. Furthermore, as part of the same test, we also looked at our compression, and between the blue, basically blue GA and the blue uh, fixed pack of uh, mod four we were able to squeeze out 40 to 90% better compression compared to our original GA. So while I decided to basically take it from a different angle, I could talk about individual features, what we've done, and we could spend a full hour on that. But instead, I wanted to showcase what customers can expect when they move from 11.5.0 to 11.5.4 and subsequent releases while leveraging all these new features. Now, we also, uh, I actually, I'm gonna go back a little bit in history. During the IDAP 2019 in Charlotte, um, the number one complaint from the gold consultants and customers that I spoke over there is that we don't do enough. There's not enough materials from certifications, from kind of webinars, from sessions that I can actually learn about what's the latest. So our product, DB2 product management, has came up with an excellent series, sessions of, ser series of sessions and webinars on all various types of DB2 topics. So as you can see about AI, development recruit, uh, inclusivity, um, that DB, uh, DB is resilient, DB2 is resilient. So this is when the enterprise grade is coming, unboxing various mod packs, what we've been adding to that console management, so on and so forth. So it's a wealth of kind of webinars. Now, the links to the webinars are over here. While you might see that the dates are already passed, however, all those webinars are still available online and viewable for free. Okay, so I strongly encourage you to basically follow up, follow up and look at the topic of your interest and just see this webinar. We're gonna, by the way, continue doing this. We see it as an excellent means for customers to be able to actually learn more about the DB2 at the time of their choice. Um, this is something maybe it'll, it'll be a little more like an advertisement, but I wanna say that we've been changing, we're starting to be recognized. In 2020, DB2 has won Gardner Pierce Insight Customer Choice Award for our DBMS. We've got something, many of you might not even know what it is, but the Red Dot. Red Dot is actually Design Award. So in 2020, DB2 on the Cloud has won the Red Dot Design Award winner for its user experience in our cloud. Nikkei Japan Magazine has named DB2 as a number one database, being actually Oracle, beating Microsoft, when it comes to dimensions like support, cost, overall satisfactions, performance, reliability. Now, from our customer engagement, we have been strongly investing in our support. It's obviously critical that our customers feel that the support is there for them when they need us most. And GB2 NPS, the net promoted score, has been highest ever, period. I just wanna leave it at that. So in this deck, you will see, I, I, Cloudpack for Data is how we actually fit in the broader data and AI ecosystem. I'm not gonna spend time on this just yet. Uh, there's tons of information and resources on the end of this deck, anything from the videos, the webinars links, uh, links to the drivers, the, the all kinds of modern DB2 drivers. So what I want to leave with is that we at IBM understand the DB2 importance. We are investing. We are rebuilding, re-architecting DB2 to become a database of the next generation. Thank you. And I would like to open to questions. Our question queue is uh, clear right now, but uh, okay. great, great information. So there's only two things. So I already lost everybody or I explained everything so well. I think you explained <laughs> everything so well. It, it certainly is a, a great, a great presentation. And there's a lot of information and there's, you know, it's interesting to me, like I, I, I'm relatively new to DB2. I only started with it in 1985. And, Ouch. <laughs> and, and there's people, there's people, uh, who who are older and I think most of those have retired now, but it, it continues to amaze me just how many things that are added to a product still named DB2 that that has been going on for the last 30, 36 years, 38, 40 years almost. Um, and it's it's fantastic just to watch the product continue to evolve and grow. And uh, the needs are certainly changing as we've moved into the web world and uh, all the other things going on. And, and containerization and, and modernization of, of IT uh, assets and that sort of thing. And it's it's great that IBM's been doing all this work and we appreciate it. 
um, as a customer, I certainly do. And, you know, Martin, if I, you know, I'm going to basically, it's just the beginning of our journey. We see a trend of enterprises looking more for like a polyglot databases. Yes. They're able to run everywhere and satisfy their heterogeneous applications, their needs, their workloads. Yes. So perhaps I can invite myself to the next session, or I'm actually going to suggest that our distinguished engineer, Herbert Panera, is going to discuss our future of Auto SQL and how DB2 will be playing in that space. And I believe it's going to be an exciting session as it will actually talk of our convergence of our DB2 warehouse technology, our DB2 Big SQL, which allows you running queries on top of natively on top of object store, data and object store, right. natively on top of Hadoop, and then actually infusion of our new latest DB2 data virtualization technologies that take it even a step farther that beyond the hub and spoke model of DB2 federation that basically allows you to federate the queries to introducing computational mesh that can create the virtualized views over data and the clouds and Oracle, SQL Server, Snowflake, um, Object Store, traditional, you know, traditional on-prem databases, or even, even flat files on disk and Excel spreadsheets. So we believe that this is, the next, this is where the market is going. This is running in warehousing and the future of warehousing in a cloud native attributes. So I believe it will be a very exciting session. I would love the opportunity to present that. Perfect. We'll see what we can do. Okay, let's uh, end with our final question that we always ask people is, did you learn anything today? We like to uh, have people uh, answer this and uh, we've got people, we've got the uh, answers quickly on this. We got 100%. Oh, well. It's always nice to get 100%, isn't it? Very much so. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. So with that, we, we've ended pretty much on the top of the hour, which sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. It's not a problem if we don't, but it's always nice for people in the East Coast to have lunch on time. So we appreciate everybody showing up. Thanks once again, Piotr, for a fantastic presentation. It's always great to have you here. And I'll be posting the uh, handout and the other information around the presentation later on today. Have a great weekend and we'll see you in two Thank weeks. Thank you very much, Marco. We'll see you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Great. Bye. Great. Bye-bye.